Our next speaker is Dr. Herbert Stein. Dr. Stein is a staff psychiatrist at the Brooklyn VA and director of the Post Traumatic Stress Disorder Treatment Program. He will be talking about post traumatic stress disorder symptoms and treatment. Dr. Stein. Thank you. When Mac asked me to uh, speak here, he actually didn't actually ask me, he just showed me the program, my name was on it. Uh, it, it occurred to me that although I've talked about the subject to a number of audiences, that in a way, in one respect, this is the most difficult audience to talk to it about, in that it's, it feels kind of arrogant to tell people about themselves. You know what troubles you. You know the pains you have and the symptoms you have. What I'll try to do is help organize that and then maybe make it a little more intelligible, a little more understandable for all of you. Uh, and a little bit about what we can do in terms of treatment and what's available. <clears throat> You've all, I'm sure, or many, not all, by this point all have heard uh, about PTSD. Most, many of you have been told that you have PTSD. Uh, and let me just try and clarify what that is, since I'm sure it's a question in a number of people's minds. It's actually fairly simple. Uh, but it sounds complex at times. PTSD stands for post-traumatic stress disorder. Fancy title. The key word is trauma. This basically is a condition that happens when people, after people suffer a trauma. Any kind of severe trauma. And I'll explain in a moment what a trauma is. Uh, this is the results of suffering through something very traumatic. <coughs> Uh, what's a trauma? A trauma is anything out of the ordinary which is overwhelming to one's being. It can be life-threatening. It doesn't have to be life-threatening. It can be threatening to one's moral fiber. It can be threatening to one's sense of integrity, to one's sense of who one is. Uh, it can be threatening to, to, one's, to the system around you, to your, your family and your and your, and your lifestyle, the life you've been living. Uh, it doesn't have to be war. You don't have to be through a war, go through a war to have post-traumatic stress disorder. Natural disasters like earthquakes and hurricanes, as we've just seen, can cause post-traumatic stress disorder as well. Reaction to a trauma. Being in a fire, it can be very traumatic, whether it was the result of, of a lightning bolt, a fire being set, or something that happened in combat. And you can have the symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder. The post stands for after, after the trauma. Stress speaks for itself and disorder. Uh, now, one of the diff there are a number of differences, though, between post-traumatic stress disorder as they occur in other, in other situations, most of the situations, and those that occur in wartime. One of the biggest differences is that ordinarily that the trauma suffered in war it's not a single trauma. Most people go through an earthquake, unless they're particularly unlucky, or we have, don't go through a second earthquake right away, and they have some aftershocks, but they don't go through the same trauma. People who, who have escaped a fire, that's it. They've had the fire. People in a bad accident. In war, the trauma is repeated over and over and over again. And in addition to the, to the trauma, the, the specific traumas, there's a constant stress that goes along with it during war, as you all know, as Mac pointed out. One of the things that, uh, we, we had a speaker here last year on combat stress, and the, the effects of combat, the, 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 one, of the, the, um, one of the factors that probably determines most the amount of the number of psychiatric casualties of severity is the number of days in combat. And compared to other wars, you probably were in more days in combat than in other wars, even though they may have been um, out, they may have been there for a longer period of time. The number of actual battle days. Now, this obviously some veterans from World War II, Korean War, did suffer through many, many days of combat, depending on the situation. I would guess that many of the veterans who were island hopping uh, in the Pacific did suffer that, the constant, almost constant fighting. But Many of you were out there for almost a year under the constant stress of combat, the danger of it, and actual combat in many cases. 
the worse the stress, the worse the convoy, the worse the travel, the more frequent the travel, the worse is going to be the condition. It's, it's almost as simple as that. Obviously, yeah. people differ in their abilities to adapt and their abilities to heal, but the, the, the length of the condition, the severity of the condition, is, is certainly closely related to the amount that you've been through. There are, are both acute and chronic post-traumatic stress disorders. And for most of you who served in Vietnam, it's chronic. Chronic because you were there for a long period of time, you had many multiple traumas, it had a profound effect on your life at a very formative stage of your life. So that the effects just haven't gone away. And uh, unlike some other traumas that people go through, in which they will suffer many of the same symptoms, maybe quite intensely for periods of months or even a couple of years, they gradually will begin to recover. And uh, that's not always the case. There are certainly severe traumas that people do continue to have s severe symptoms for from for many, many years. But often, the people in the earthquake, for instance, most of them, I would think, will have some, most of those who do suffer serious personal traumas will begin to recover over the next year or two, much more likely than someone who's been through a year of, of combat in Vietnam, or even longer in some cases, obviously. Let me just talk a little bit about what the symptoms are, what happens to you after a trauma, what, what can happen to you after a trauma. There are basically three kinds of, of symptoms, and I'm sure you'll recognize them. The first are basically the symptoms of remembering, of reliving and remembering what you went through. And this is really very, very uh, classically attached to, to being through a severe trauma. Uh, I'll just read to you from, from just the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, the official word, and I think you'll recognize it. Recurrent and intrusive distressing recollections, it's putting mildly, of the event in young children, uh, when young children repetitive play. Recurring distressing dreams of the event, nightmares, which I'm sure you all know about. Sudden acting or feeling as if the traumatic event were recurring. Includes a sense of reliving the experience, illusions, hallucinations, flashbacks, uh, even those that occur upon awakening or when intoxicated. Uh, intense psychological distress and exposure to events that symbolize or resemble an aspect of the trauma, including anniversaries. Many of you, I'm sure, have experienced that. It's some reminder of the war, some reminder of a particular episode throws you into a, a, a state of intense remembering and intense, in some cases, intense reliving. It may be a thought, that with it some anxiety, it may be the, a recurrence of the feelings that you had at the time. It may really be that you'll feel you're there at that moment, or half here and half there. Uh, and those are the, the, the flashbacks. Flashbacks usually, by the way, are not remembered. People will tell you about them. It's particularly frightening to hear about something that's happened to you. The second set of symptoms have to do with trying to avoid it. It's really this is a, an, an illness of, in a way, an illness of remembering, an illness of memories. And you make many attempts to avoid it by shutting out, by staying away from anything that might remind you. Although I've found that veterans often are drawn both to and away from the, from the things that remind them. That they will try to stay away and yet sometimes will be drawn to, to see a particular movie or something. Um, the second is, as Mac pointed out, the, the numbing trying to shut off all feeling altogether, trying to uh, just blot out sensations and feelings. Um, forgetting. Often people who've been through traumas will not remember basic things that happened in the trauma and will be able to remember it actually after some period of time of, of talking about it in treatment. Uh, in World War II they did a lot of work with um, um, what do they call it, uh, hypnotics, to, to get people into a, uh, I forget what they used to call that, uh, um, put people under and, and have them remember, and, and like as in hypnosis. Uh, memories that are there, but are blotted out, avoided. And I certainly know I've talked with many Vietnam vets who really don't want to remember, can't remember, and we start talking with them and we find out why they can't remember because when they begin to remember there's a flood of feeling, very painful feeling. And we've had some veterans that we've worked with for long periods of time uh, where they really couldn't remember very much what happened and then finally did begin to remember a little bit about what happened even though they'd been having the anxiety. The third types of symptoms 
But you will know that also are the general symptoms. Anxiety, sleeplessness, irritability, a tendency to get into to get angry, depression, um, sensitivity to stimuli, noises, just general noises, not just specific to the condition. Uh, I'm sure you all recognize, well, I'm fairly sure you all recognize these symptoms. And what's actually striking is how how similar these symptoms, how, how often these symptoms are there. Uh, that one of the things that many of you felt, I think, when you came back from Vietnam, began to experience these symptoms, and maybe your families felt too, is, I'm, a, I'm really a strange bird. Why do I do these strange things? And in fact, what you have been through, what you do, is really very similar to what many other veterans have been through and done. And I'm sure many of you know that by now, because you've spoken with other veterans, particularly in the last few years, and you've heard about it, and that helps. Talk a little bit about how we approach the problem, how we treat it. Uh, there's no one definitive treatment, and I'll talk mostly about how we're approaching it here and some of the philosophy of the treatment here. Um, first of all, we have a few principles that we work on, at least here. Uh, now I think different places have different approaches to it, but I'll just tell you our principles. First principle of treatment that we approach is that of try, that our goal is to improve the quality of your lives without specifying what that will mean. It's in, in treatment. Many people, many people who have been through war are suffering deeply, suffering in many ways, sometimes not functioning very well, often not functioning very well, often in a great deal of pain. We don't try to set a goal for you. You know, We want you to get back to work. We want you to get back to doing this or that. Obviously, there are certain things that are going to be better than others, but we try to really just have a general aim in terms of the program for the, of, the, of somehow improving the quality of your lives whatever you're going to be doing, that it should be, you should feel that your life is more productive, meaningful, and less painful. Let me just say, actually backtrack a moment, say that there are actually two kinds of specialized programs for treatment of Vietnam vets. There are specialized inpatient units, which usually will take veterans for two, three months at the most. Some, I guess some of them have been a little longer, and which the there is a great deal of work done intensively to get the veteran to confront and deal with the problems of the memories that he's both trying to forget and can't forget. The second type of program are outpatient programs. And I'm mainly talking about the outpatient program uh, as I'm talking about treatment here, but both are valuable. The, the, that hinges on the second goal, the second principle I'm going to talk about. And that's that this is a long-term, a chronic condition. This is not something that's just going to go away in a short period of time. You're not going to come in, get a few sessions, get some medication, and feel better. Some of you may be able to. Some of you who's, who have a milder condition. Not everybody has the same degree of, of suffering. But in general, this is going to be, uh, well, I don't know, to use a... Um, a nasty metaphor, uh, this is going to be a guerrilla warfare. It's going to take a long time, and probably some of the symptoms will always be with you. And the goals are to ease that, to, to help you to feel more productive, and to have those symptoms maybe be with you less and more under your control. But this is not a, a condition that's going to be treated and just go away in a short period of time. And, Certainly our program is geared towards that, that we expect people to be made to either be in the program for a long period of time or to come and go in some cases, but that they're going to need treatment ongoing. The third principle that I want to get into a little more deeply is we try to use group approaches to a great extent. And the reasons that we do that have a lot to do with what happened when you came back from Vietnam, the conditions when you came back from Vietnam. First is what I mentioned before, that when you came back, and Mac mentioned this too, there was a tendency to feel isolated, to be alone, and to not know what was wrong with you, to feel that there was something wrong. You have friends and family look at you strangely or even tell you this, you're different, you're not the same person. And for many years, that was part of your anxiety. 
again, I feel this arrogance of telling you part of your anxiety, and you know that <laughs> it was, obviously. There is some reassurance when veterans get together with, with other veterans and begin to compare notes and realize that what they've been going through is a result of what happened to them. That it's true, you came from different backgrounds, some of you would have had emotional problems if you'd never been in the war, but that many of the things that you were experiencing were, were follow logically from what you've been through. That, that to go through conditions of having people try to kill you and trying to kill other people and killing other people, that those are not normal conditions in our society and they, and they have results that are fairly consistent. That the symptoms that you have, even some of the, the little things that, that aren't even directly related to, to, to the post-traumatic stress disorder, many of you found when you came back you were doing little quirky things like sleeping under the bed or on the floor. And I've, I've been in a group of Vietnam vets where that was discussed, and one by one everybody said, yeah, I did that too, and realized that it had something to do with the fact that you always slept low to the ground or on the ground when you were, when you were over there, and it was difficult to readjust and to change habits when you came back. So one of the goals of, of trying to get people together is so that they can compare notes and know that they're not alone with this condition and they're not crazy. I saw on the yellow sheet that it's a 1977, something like three quarters of uh, of uh, Vietnam vets were misdiagnosed as being schizophrenic. And I certainly believe that because I know when I first came to the VA, I didn't know what to make of this condition. I would see a veteran come in and without getting the, the complete history about the work, I would see that this was somebody who was hearing voices, who was violent or agitated, maybe had gone through a flashback, and I didn't realize that at the time. And was a bit perplexed because the person didn't react the way somebody ordinarily does who has a psychotic condition. There was a difference, but I couldn't quite tell what. And then I began to hear about this condition, to ask about the war, and found out a little more that there was a connection there. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the fact that one was, in some cases, hearing voices is what made for the misdiagnosis. That alone were the flashbacks, uh, the, the unusual behavior or the episodes of violence that, that seemed to just come out of nowhere. Um, and a lot of you were misdiagnosed, and a lot of you misdiagnosed yourselves. You thought, I must just be out of my mind. This, you know, didn't, it didn't, so for whatever reasons, didn't put it together. Well, I can, I can say what one of the reasons is, because the experiences in Vietnam were horrible enough. You didn't want to think about them. You didn't want to connect them with anything. And you try to block them out most of the time. Um, I've seen veterans who very clearly were suffering from their experiences in the war who try to push it back and say, no, there's nothing to do with that. The, the second reason that we try to encourage group therapy, group activities, is that one of the things we found is that one of the traumas of the war that maybe have not been as clearly noticed, although Mac alluded to it, was that when you came back from Vietnam, you really were all alone all of a sudden. Although it's true, as Mac said, that there were, wasn't the same cohesion uh, of loyalty, perhaps, to one's company or division or whatever, although there so certainly is some in many cases, there's certain, usually, each, each person usually had one, two, three buddies with whom he was very close, particularly those of you who were in combat and, and for long periods of time. There usually were a few people who watched your back and you watched their back, went through the most of the way, you didn't trust some of the new people coming in, didn't want to get to know new people because you knew that they might get killed and that the, the, the guys coming in were even more likely to get killed. But when you came back over here, you lost the security of that small group. Also lost security of having a gun, which was your only protection over there in some respects. That was the way you protected yourself. You were back in civilian life without a gun, without a license to use a gun, and without the, the small group of friends that you had. And many of you felt more scared back here than you did when you were over there. You were plenty scared over there. I don't want to diminish that by any means, but I think that the anxiety back over here in some ways was greater because all of a sudden the things that had been protecting you for a year, the bonding and friendships, were gone. Uh, 
I think along with that, many of you experienced the feeling of isolation over there, felt abandoned over there, had images that back here, the world was going on as normal, and to many respects, in many respects it was. That is one difference from other wars, particularly World War II, where the whole country seemed to be involved. I uh, had images that the people back home were still enjoying holidays and uh, still eating well and weren't... Uh, weren't sleeping uh, on the ground and getting wet or, or, or boiling. There was a certain, and coming back then, the one group with whom you did feel a closeness, with whom you felt some, some sense that these were the people who were there when you most needed somebody there, were gone all of a sudden. And of course you didn't all come back together. So there was also the sense of abandoning them. Being together in group therapy or in some kind of a community, I think, seems to help with that since that feeling that once again you can begin to relate to other people who are over there maybe not the same people but there does seem to be more of a sense of security that develops in that kind of setting third reason that group therapy is particularly helpful and i'm talking about groups of vietnam combat veterans by combat veterans i really mean veterans who are in the combat zone i don't mean that you had to be uh in, in infantry because obviously there were a lot of people in all kinds of MOSs over there who suffered, who were in combat, in the conditions of combat, in one way or another, uh, is that this is one point where the post-traumatic stress disorder of the veteran differs somewhat from other, uh, from others. Uh, the degree of conflict over values that you come back with is just enormous. You come from a society in which you learn thou shalt not kill, in which you're brought up, you're brought up in a family, you're brought up in a, in a society in which, sure, there are killings, there are streets are dangerous, etc., but basically the values that you grew up with were the values of civilian values. Join or draft, either enlisted or drafted into the Army or the Marines, in some cases the Navies too, because the Navy did have some, some units in Vietnam, and you're really taught a whole new set of values. You're really taught, as Matt pointed out, the whole the value actually that the what was what you were prided for was the, the body count killing. Uh, and how could you even challenge those values? You can't be over there and just ignore those values and say, no, I'm a civilian. I don't believe where I I I'm, we grew up in. A, you know, I went to church all the time, and I don't believe in killing. I mean, that's you're not going to survive very long. Though like that, obviously. And the first time you do have to shoot at somebody, the first time you do kill somebody, how are you going to suddenly say to yourself, gee, I shouldn't have done that? You can't do that. That's impossible. You can't survive in war under those conditions. But then coming back, once again you're expected suddenly to take on the old values. And the moral dilemmas are, are enormous. Uh, the, you know, the the uh, therapists who treat you were confronted with some of these dilemmas. You know, we know that we didn't have to actually experience them ourselves, but certainly can recognize the moral dilemmas of having been in this situation where you had to do something, and then coming back to another situation where you have to condemn the very thing that you did, or at least that's what the, the, the society says. It wasn't helped by the fact that, that, our, that at the particular time the country itself didn't get much support. Uh, the country itself often people at home often also were going through all kinds of conflicts about the war and a lot of guilt and, and a lot of that guilt and, and was expressed in anger towards the veterans themselves, towards the, the soldiers themselves. But in, in a group of veterans who have been through it, at least there's a forum to talk about it. At least there's a place where you can talk with other people who really can understand that moral dilemma, who, don't, who you feel aren't just going to sit back and say, well, yeah, I understand that at a distance, but really, you're not supposed to do these things. People who will understand, who've been through it, who know what it's like, and who know the the who know that that it's not a, something that you can simply cubbyhole and say, well, it isn't okay, or yes, it is okay. Uh, and I don't mean just that in your groups you just reassure each other, because I've never seen that people reassuring each other helps tremendously. It may help somewhat, some encouragement. But being able to talk about these dilemmas, open them up, it gives you a chance to ventilate them, it gives you a chance to talk about them more openly, 
and to work them out in your own minds and to work them out with other people who've been through them and to also recognize that, again, you're not alone in this. You're not a monster with, with a different set of values than the rest of your society. You're a human being who's been through a very unusual, perhaps putting it mildly, situation. So that's another reason that we kind of that we try to encourage group, group therapy and, and the use of groups. I had a fourth reason I forgot for a second. Let me just take a look at it. Um, Okay. The, the types of treatment then, uh, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do here, a little bit about what's available in general. We try to encourage the use of group therapy where we can. First of all, about treatment. Sometimes people say, I don't want to go back and remember what happened to me during the war. It's going to make me more upset. And the rule of thumb that we use, and I think it's a fair rule of thumb, is if you're able to forget and it's not troubling you that much, God bless you. If you're not able to forget, if the thoughts are there and you're thinking about the war all the time, or every time you, you walk past uh, a Chinese restaurant, you, you, you begin to feel anxious, or every time you hear a firecracker July 4th, you, you find yourself suddenly hitting the ground or running down into your basement, then probably you can't forget and you're going to have to try to remember and cope with what happened to you. So that's really the rule of thumb that we use, that if you feel that you can cope with remembering or that you feel that you can't forget anyway, then it's probably worthwhile to try to work on what happened to you. If you can forget it, if your symptoms are mild, you have a, a nightmare every year or two, or and uh, you have some anxiety at times, but it's pretty mild, and insomnia isn't too bad, then maybe you are better off not trying to go back into it. I don't know if everybody would agree with that, but that's certainly the, the principle that we follow, and sort of let people self-select on that, obviously. Try to encourage group therapy for the reasons that I told. We also here have tried to establish a community for Vietnam vets. Uh, that's what this is all about, the hooch. Uh, I say we. Really, uh, what we did was the staff just essentially opened up the possibility of a community for the veterans here. And uh, most of you have, have, a great number of you have taken this up on and have really organized yourselves into a community. Uh, we found that very helpful, that a lot of you can begin to feel more comfortable in a community of other veterans and have begun to branch out and to do other things, to begin to do volunteer work in the hospital, uh, have begun to do things and also helped other veterans begun to feel a little, some more meaningfulness in your own lives because the depression, the sense that your life is, is meaningless, the sense of hating yourself because of the people you left behind, because of the, the people uh, whose lives you felt you destroyed, the things that happened over there, the guilt, the depression, can be enormous, can make you feel that, that your life just has no meaning, couldn't possibly have meaning, can't take any pleasure. We found that in a community with other Vietnam veterans, it's, uh, that you can begin to take some pleasure, to begin to have some more sense of meaningfulness, and begin to do things that you feel are productive and that give you more of a sense of meaning. Uh, and that's been quite helpful, and uh, I hope that uh, the programs will, I, I'm sure they will begin to take that up. Uh, obviously, even when it's not set up in a formal way, in many VA hospitals, I'm sure Vietnam veterans begin to congregate and begin to, to do things amongst themselves. We've tried to formalize that a little more. Uh, individual therapy, obviously, is also very helpful because there are some problems that are better worked out individually. Some people don't like groups. I mean, that's true. It doesn't have to be a Vietnam veteran. I mean, some people just don't like groups and aren't comfortable in groups. Some Vietnam veterans don't like groups because they're afraid of what they're going to hear and gradually maybe can begin to go into a group. But uh, in general, uh, some people do better with individual treatment. And in individual treatment, you may be able to work out some of the personal problems and some of the problems that came from before the war. Because obviously, the war didn't insulate you. It didn't cleanse your whole life, the rest of your life. There are problems that many of you had before the war, and, uh, and that shouldn't be surprising. So there may be other things to work out, and sometimes things that happened during the war related to that. Uh, many of you are probably wondering about medications. There's no medication for this condition that really 
can, anyone can say definitively is the best treatment for this condition. Uh, we and other places have found that antidepressant medications often are helpful, helpful to the extent that they can lift depression enough, maybe uh, make you f feel enough of a control over yourself that, that you can begin to get involved in treatment and begin to interact better. Uh, it's certainly not foolproof. Uh, sometimes in very in low doses, the, the medications that, uh, the Thorazine type medications that were given to many veterans in high doses before the diagnosis was clear, sometimes in low doses can be actually helpful in helping you control some of the feelings of ragefulness. Uh, but there's certainly nothing definitive. And the one thing that I can't really be, give you a great optimistic statement about certainly is the insomnia. My experience is that, and I think most people, is that most Vietnam veterans, most combat veterans, well, I guess particularly from Vietnam, have tremendous difficulty sleeping. We know some of the reasons. Part of it is because of the nightmares that you're going to experience when you go to sleep. Part of it is because you're on guard duty, because you knew that nighttime was the nighttime was the Viet Cong's time, was was was. Uh, the, was the time when you really had to be on guard and somebody had to be up and you know the rest of your family isn't going to be on guard duty all night and very often veterans will really stay in that light sleep just waiting to see what's going to happen and I know some veterans even patrol their neighborhoods at times in quotes and uh, it's not uncommon. Um, also I suppose the fact that many of you have, have over the years used drugs and alcohol probably has made the sleep disorder more it had something to do with the sleep disorder. I can't say for sure, but I certainly suspect that that's a factor, too. But I, I wouldn't say that those veterans who didn't use alcohol and drugs don't have it, because I think the insomnia is fairly common and for that, almost universal. And, I, and I'm not terribly optimistic. I mean, I tell you the same things I tell anybody else with a sleep who, who has insomnia. Uh, not to do anything, not to take anything that's a stimulant, like caffeine and things like that. Uh, to try to get some exercise, because that can certainly be helpful. Um, the more active you are, the, the more likely you can get some sleep, but I, I don't really have any great promises for that. Um, other areas in terms of treatment. The specialized inpatient units can be very helpful, particularly the veterans who have begun to deal with some of the problems about the war already, maybe in outpatient clinics, but who are having difficulty really confronting some of the things that happen to them, are aware that there are problems, they're aware there's tremendous tension, that there are some issues and memories that they really have to work out. The other thing about those units is that they're very, some of them are very comfortable and you feel supported there. You know, in the middle of the night, if you wake up from a nightmare, there's somebody there, other veterans, other staff, and someone to talk to. So for the, that it really does add an, uh, some comfort during that time and gives you a place where you can more comfortably work out your problems. Uh, but there's still a lot of work to do when you come back from a program like that. Uh, they're very good at getting people to recognize what needs to be done, but you really there's a lot of work to be done afterwards. I think in terms of other types of support, and there'll be some other talks later on in terms of vocational rehab and other issues of getting back to either work or other functioning, but I, I'm going to stay away from that and just try to talk mostly about the treatment. Um, let me think. Actually, what I think I'll do right now is open up some questions, and maybe questions will jog a few more things that, that might that might be of importance in terms either of the condition itself, what it's about, or about the treatment of it. So maybe open to some questions. Yeah. My name is Isaiah Benton, and I'm a Vietnam vet, but uh, there was an experiment that took place in the 60s. It took place in every war. They took the uh, lower educated veterans. I'm going to start with the Vietnam era. And they took 100,000 that, that project experiment. So they went through the United States and certain geographical areas on the McNamara. And they took these men and drafted them and lowered the test standards so they can go in because of the manpower shortage. And maybe for another factor to keep those who were in college who were getting the permits because they were more educated from going and be killed. Now that number went up to 350,000. These men who survived came back to the United States. And I believe right now a lot of them are in shelters, in prisons, and being mistreated by 
Chinese government, then you have to that. Do you have a solution for that problem at the same time? Well, I certainly don't have a solution in that those who are being mistreated and those who are in prisons, a lot of them... No, I mean, the I, question is, yeah. when this government decides to draft the first 100,000 and experiment, mm -hmm. then they escalated that to 350,000. Out of that 350,000, those who return, they must be having all types yeah, of problems. Yeah, sure. And the only thing I can say is is that the more that people are aware of this condition, the more that psychiatrists are aware of it, the more that people who work in the jails are aware of it and other places are aware of it, the more likely these people are going to come to the attention of those, come to the attention and maybe refer to programs. I wish I had a better solution. Do you have a suggestion? I have a suggestion. Yeah. 20 years ago when they came back from overseas, 10 years ago when they set up these outings, Minorities who went in there, a lot of them were mistreated. A lot of them became disrupted. They didn't take advantage of some of the programs that were offered mm -hmm. in the forum to all honorable discharge. Mm -hmm. All right? And today, they suffer for that, and they are condemned for that by how to be those who were in charge. I agree with you. I think that, uh, that for a long, long time, uh, when a veteran came to the Vietnam vet came to the VA, uh, he, he they didn't re people didn't recognize what was wrong with him, uh, and he wasn't properly treated. There certainly was no debriefing when anybody came back. And as for the issue of who went into the war, I know a little bit about that firsthand because I worked at the examining station in Fort Hamilton towards the end of the war. But I know for a fact. I mean, we I could tell you just the way, the way it worked. It wasn't even as if there was a, a single plot, but the fact is, I, I forget which days it was, but on on um, Monday and Wednesday, we would see poor kids from Brooklyn, and on Tuesday and Thursday, we would see middle-class kids from Long Island, and on Monday and Wednesday, we'd see a bunch of kids who didn't really know what was going on and would go through a physical, and most of them would be accepted unless we picked up something on the physical. And on Tuesday and Thursday, we'd see a lot of people with a lot of letters with, from doctors, all kind, documenting all kinds of things, and then even would, in fact, uh, not go into the war. I'm sure that this was a war in which the, uh, the underprivileged particularly were chosen. And, uh, you know, I, I can't say that I blame the people who came in with the letters, because I can understand that they also didn't want to have to go through this. Nobody wants to go through this. But you're absolutely right. and I. Uh, I agree with you. I think that there were injustices done. I think that there were, that that at the very least, when people came back from Vietnam, there should have been some treatment then. There should have been some recognition that they that there was going to be a problem. There was none. Now that may some of it may have been oversight. I don't know. And another big error about the Vietnam vet, Korean veterans have problems. World War II. That's right. Have problems. Some who are still alive from World War One. That's true. Have psychological yeah. problems. Yeah. You can't be in combat and not have problems. So you can't zero in on the Vietnam uh, combat. Yeah. You have to take in every. Yeah. There are some things that were there, there. are some things that are that are somewhat distinguishing. But yes, I, my experience is that people who have been through heavy combat uh, suffer from it and suffer the same symptoms and have post-traumatic stress disorder. I think that with the World War II vets, there may have been a little more. Uh, support from the society, from the families, and that helped a little bit in terms outwardly, in terms of their functioning, but the suffering is <coughs> certainly there. Let me take another question. Or something. On the, uh, when the, the VA started out on a word schizo, have, that word alone has destroyed many veterans economically. Are uh, you, as a doctor, going to help us change this? And then if it is, does get changed, the word schizo, Show the computer, because it has destroyed me with getting jobs with the city, state, mm -hmm. government, and dealing with the VA. Mm -hmm. oh, this guy's a skit. Mm -hmm. You know, I've had enough of it. Yeah. You know, and I'm afraid this guy's turned it. So we do need help when the you gave us, not you personally, yeah. but when it first started out. Are you right? You know, thanks. Any questions? <laughs> Yeah. 
don't know what you mean. I don't know what you mean. No. No. I mean, there's nothing that prevents someone who's been through a trauma from having another psychiatric condition. There are sometimes. If someone has another condition, you try to address it. But here we're talking about treating the post-traumatic stress disorder. Saying, Phil, but as if if you're asking about people moving on from the treatment on to getting into other functioning. Well, that's why I say that this is a that's why I say this is a chronic condition. And in terms of the outpatient treatment, I think we have to consider that, that people are going to be in treatment for many, many years and may leave treatment at time and come back. But that we consider people to continue in treatment. So I didn't talk about medication. Talk about treatment. I mean, some people need medication. The objective is just what I told you: to help people improve the quality of their life, and that's pretty general. And what that means, it can mean different things to different people, but it means that one's life should be less painful, should have some degree of pleasure and feeling of productiveness, should that they should have some feeling of being able to relate to others and to... Well, the financial end, yeah, I'm talking... Phil, the financial end, I'm, I'm talking right now about treatment, and there will be some talk about later on about... Yeah, I agree. Uh, Obviously, the, the financial end is related, but it's somewhat separate. The, the, how will the financial end be solved? Well, in some cases by people finding work, in other cases by getting compensation. Uh, the man has a label as a PTSD, he has a diagnosis as PTSD. Mm -hmm. There's not too many places that's going to lie about what he's thinking about. It's some sort of, uh, Sometimes that's a problem. Right? Yeah. Sometimes that's a problem. Oh. Yeah, I agree. That is a problem. And uh, obviously, you can just educate people. And educate people that people with post-traumatic stress disorder can go back to work and can be productive. And we just, it's just a matter of educating people as best we can. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, it's a good question. Everybody here? The question? About um, with people who are dual diagnosed, who also have drug and alcohol problems, which is certainly common. We have not insisted, I mean, obviously we want people to be drug and alcohol free. We have not kept people out of the program because they're not. Uh, we have, and we try to do it on an individual basis. If we think that somebody's alcohol or drug problem is so severe that we can't treat them, then we'll approach it that way and try to refer them for alcohol or drug treatment first. If we feel that this is the way that they're going to grab onto the ledge and begin to get some treatment, we'll take them in. And we have had some success with some people who came in who had, uh, not the most severe, but who had alcohol or, or drug problems, who were able to then on their own get get help for that or to begin to get to stop with the alcohol it's sometimes easier than with the drugs I find but uh, 
but that we'll be able to begin to go to AA or get other help even to ask for hand abuse. We've had some success with people who will move from this to getting alcohol and drug treatment. We've had some success with some people who first had to get the treatment for the substance abuse before they could even begin to confront it. We get a lot of patients, by the way, who come to us after they've solved the alcohol or drug problem, because that's often when symptoms become worse. Someone who's been heavily into substances, they may be symptomatic, but they may drown it out with alcohol or drugs. So they may not remember the nightmares they're having and do begin to remember and experience more after they stop using a substance. One other thing, by the way, I didn't mention about treatment is uh, really two other aspects that I just want to put in because they're important. One is that for specific symptoms, phobias, certain types of anxieties, behavior modification techniques may be useful desensitizing somebody in particular to a particular symptom. I don't want to leave that out. And the other thing is, and I left it out partly because there's going to be another talk about it, a whole talk about it, the involvement of family members uh, that are here for this. We, we, we'd like to do more as we expand, but we do have a group for, uh, for spouses and, and uh, close relatives of uh, veterans, and uh, we try to encourage family members to become involved and uh, because we think that that's very important. I partly didn't emphasize it because there's a whole other talk directly afterwards about it from Dr. Mitsakis, who's... We're going to get the last question, Dr. Sai, because we're running all... Yeah, time. okay. All right, thank you very much. Quickly.